Hello and welcome back, Anchor Church, back to Online Church. We love having you here. If you would take a moment and just go to our YouTube page, Anchor Church ABQ, hit the like and subscribe button and make sure to also hit the notification button. That way, anytime we post a video, you get a notification. Also, let us know that you're here. Write down in the comments, just let us know that you're here so that we can be praying for you. Even if it's May of 2022 and you are watching this video, we wanna know that you are watching so that we can be praying for you and come alongside you. We'll be right back with the sermon. It's so good to be back with you this week. I'm glad that we are getting to continue on in our series through the book of Ecclesiastes. I would love, just like Jordan said in the introduction, if you're watching this, we'd love to connect with you. If you want to comment on our YouTube page or on our Facebook page, we're, we're all over the internet. Come connect with us. We want to know that you're watching. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. So shoot me a message. Whatever, I'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you as you participate in our online service. We'd like to know who you are and, and where you're watching from. That'd be great. But we are, we're continuing on in our Ecclesiastes series this week, finding meaning in the seasons of life. Last week, we, we looked at Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, this poem about God's control in all the seasons of life. That, that in the good and the bad, in every season that God is in control. And that, that whole thing, he, it's summed up with, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven in Ecclesiastes 3.1. Well, that poem, it was like a, the illustration that, that goes along with our, our verses for this week. So this week we're going to be in chapter 3 still in verses 9 through 15, and we're going to see how God's control plays out how he's made us, and, and even a little bit of the why for why God does what he does. We might not always understand, but he gives us a little glimpse into the why. We've seen a shift in Solomon in these last few sermons. It's, gotten, it's, it's taken a more positive tone, hasn't it? He's gone from, from truly negative to, to a more positive view. He's, he's looking at that things from a, a different lens. When he was looking at things purely under the sun, it was negative. It led him to despair. We saw in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, where he says, I hated life and I hated my work. And then he was, he was wallowing in despair. Well, from then, something has changed. He's added God into the picture. Not that we can just add God to our lives and, and that's enough because God, God asks for all of our lives. God asks us to, to submit all that we are to him. But, but now that God is in the picture, he's added God to the picture and his whole outlook has changed. You see, because seeing things through the lens of God's control can change things for us. It can bring us hope and joy, even when things seem hopeless. So let's, let's look with Solomon as we continue this idea that, that God is in control of all things, that he's got a, a purpose for what he does, that there's a time and a season for everything under heaven. We're gonna, I'm going to read through verses 9 through 15, and then we'll, we'll talk through them. So look with me in your Bibles at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. He says, What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. He's made everything beautiful in its time. 
Also, he's put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is always already has been, and that which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So Solomon's continuing on from his from his poem. He's he said that there's a season and a time for everything, and he's showing God is in control of it all. And he goes on, in, and he can, starts in verses 9 through 11. We'll look at 9 and 10 first of all. And he, and he kind of repeats something that he's already said. But I would say that he repeats it from a different perspective in verses 9 and 10. You see, we've already seen Solomon like check and recheck his work. And now he's going to go back and repeat something that he said, but, but, but with that lens of God's control in it. And so we see in verses 9 and 10, he says, What gain has the worker from his toil? Before, we saw that, that all that we get from toil is sorrow and trouble, is what Solomon says. But he just asks, What gain has the worker from his toil in verse 9? And then in verse 10, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He's already asked, or he's already made that statement. But what what he said in chapter 1, verse 13, is so different from what he says now. Just one word changes the whole tone. And so let me look look at Ecclesiastes 1, 13 with you, where he says, It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I would say that, that it's a subtle shift, but that he has, he's made a shift because of what, he's, what lens he's looking at now or lens he's looking through. He's not looking through the lens of under the sun, this life apart from God, but he's looking at, at life through the lens of God's control, God's sovereign control, that he is in control of all things and that he is doing things for our Good. That's the lens that he's looking at now. And so, so it's not that the worker gains sorrow and trouble from his toil. It's not that it's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man, but he's just, he's restating it. So let me, let me show you why I think that. So first from before in the context, all the way at the end of chapter two, he says, that, that man, we can find enjoyment in our work when we see it as a blessing from God to provide for us and to bless others as well. We can find enjoyment in our work. He's, he's added God to the picture. And so what can a man gain from his toil? What can a worker gain from his toil? Enjoyment, pleasure, goodness, purpose. When looked at through the lens of God's blessing. And then, and then he jumps into this, this, this poem about how God has controlled every season, the good and the bad. There's a time and a season for everything. And so the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with, in the good and the bad, God is in control of it. So we can trust and, and hope in that control. And so, so that's from, from the context before, why I see that that Solomon has taken this turn and the shift. And then from the context right after it, we see that, that Solomon has moved from this sense that, that all of life is vanity and futility. And now that he's added God into the picture, look what he says in verse 11 at the beginning. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. So he's moved really from futility to beauty. He sees beauty in all 
things because God's hand is in it. That in the good and the bad in every season of life, God is in control and he's working it in a way that eventually, as we see, he has made everything beautiful in its time. So that's how I see that, that Solomon, he's really taken this, this shift, this, this turn in his mindset. He's seen God. He's feeling the hope that comes with a life lived under God's control. Apart from God, all his work, all his knowledge, all his accomplishments, it was vanity. It was futile. It didn't result in anything. It didn't last but here, with the perspective of God, he trusts and sees that in the good and even in the bad, that God has made everything beautiful in its time. And then there's more. He shows us, he shows us that we're, we're made for more. He says, he continues on in verse 11. He says also that he has put eternity into man's heart. He shows us that, that even in the beauty that God has made for, for this world, that God has made us for even more than that. That God has made us for eternity. Now we see this, this played out in our lives. We are all drawn to beauty, to, to transcendence, to amazing things. We see it as we look at the universe, as we look at the stars, as we look at sunsets and mountains and nature. We see it in, in films and music and books that we love, even in amazing athletic accomplishments. Our hearts are drawn to the transcendent, those things that bring us awe. We're drawn to them for some reason, and it's right here. Solomon says, and he has made or he has put eternity into man's heart. What he's saying is that we are made for more than this world. We are made for God. For all the beauty that exists in this life, we've been made for more and we instinctively know it. We yearn for the eternal. We seek out the transcendence. Our hearts are made for God. It's as the church father Augustine said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they can find peace in you. God has put eternity in our hearts. We are seeking something more than this world and it's him. But our hearts are drawn to the big and the beautiful, those things that bring us awe. Because God has made those things to point us to him. But a lot of times we miss it. We see the stars and, and their beauty and we, and we let it terminate there. We, we, as Paul says in Romans 1.23, we exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We miss the point. The awe-inspiring doesn't point us to the one who created those things that are awe-inspiring. They we, we terminate it on that thing, that experience, instead of turning and worshiping God. But it leaves us wanting. It leaves us unsatisfied. Because we're made for eternity, God has put it in our hearts. We're made to rest in God. And so, like Solomon, who, who experienced more than we ever experienced, who saw and did more than we will ever do, and he comes back and says, it's all vanity. It doesn't last. It's all fleeting and futile. When we don't find our rest in God, but find our hope in, in things that, that don't last, the things of this world, the things that God created to point us to him, then we're restless. It doesn't fulfill. It doesn't last. God has made all things to point us to him. He's in control of every season and he makes it beautiful in his time so that we can seek him. But it says, he goes on in, in verse 11, 
yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So our hearts are, are set on eternity. We're trusting in God's control over it all. We know we're made for more. And so we, we want to feel it now. But God has, God has made it so that we don't, we don't understand for what God has done from the beginning to the end. He's put mystery in this world and what he's doing with that, just what he's done with our heart's desire for the transcendent and beauty, is he's leaving us lacking so that we seek him who lacks nothing, who knows everything, who's in control of every season. And he's making everything beautiful in its time. What God's doing, he's pointing us to him. Through putting eternity in our hearts, through controlling every season, so that he knows when things will be made beautiful. But we don't know. And so what that should lead us to do is to seek him. But then Solomon goes on and he and he has a conclusion. We're made for eternity. We're made to seek God. But as we do, how do we live now? Well, he continues in verse 12 and 13. And he says that, that we're, he's moving us from, from futility to enjoyment. He says in verses 12 and 13, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. See, we're, we're, made, we're made for eternity, but, but how do we live in light of eternity now? Because we have the days from when we're born to when, we're die, when we die. So how do, we, how do we live for eternity now, knowing that, that we are made to find our rest in God? How do we live now? Solomon says, First, that we're joyful. He says in verse 12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice always. We as believers should have more reason than anyone to rejoice, to live joyfully. We trust that God is in control of every season of our life. We see that he makes everything beautiful in its time so we can hope and trust and have joy in him. But even in, even in that, we have even more of a reason because we trust that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that we've been forgiven, and that our relationship with God the Father has been restored. So we have reason for joy. That doesn't mean that we're always happy because in this world, we will have trouble, we will have sorrows, we will weep, we will mourn. But even in the mourning, even in the weeping, we trust that God is in control of it. We hope in Him. We rest on the fact that Jesus is our Savior and that we are made for eternity and that God makes everything beautiful in its time. So we, we live with this settled disposition of joy even in the hard times. And then he goes on and says that not only can we be joyful, but that we can do good as long as we live. We see it in Ephesians 2.10 that Jesus saved us. We're created for him and he, he's given us works to do, good works. Not to earn forgiveness, not to earn our relationship with God, but out of a response to that relationship with God, God has given us good works to do, to love and bless others, to point people to Jesus, to meet people's needs, to serve and care for people. And we see in, in James, in the book of James, that, that faith without works is dead. We express our living faith by doing good works. What good could, what could can you do for someone this week? Who could you love or serve? What need could you meet? 
Who could you reach out to and encourage or comfort in this season of isolation? What good can you be doing for the glory of God in response to trusting in his control? How can you live for eternity through your good works this week? And then he goes on in verse 13 and repeats something that he's already said. He says, And also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So we can, we can thankfully enjoy God's good gifts to us. I said it before. I said it a few weeks ago. But, but we can see as we live for eternity, we can thankfully enjoy the work that we have now. We can see it as a gift from God to provide for us. We can eat and drink the fruit of our work. But then that we see that it's, it's not just for us, but that our work is, is a blessing to others. So we can thankfully enjoy not just the fruit of our work, but we can enjoy any work knowing that God is using it for the good of others around us, for his glory. That, church, is how we can live in light of eternity now. We can move from futility to enjoying the good things that God has given us for God's glory, for the good of others. He moves on. He moves on. Because he's he's gonna he's gonna show us more of more of a picture of, of God's control over all things. And he's gonna he's gonna give us a glimpse. I, I alluded to it earlier, but he's gonna give us a glimpse of what he's doing. So in verse 14 he says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which already is, has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. God, he says, is he's in control over all things. And what God does, no one can change. It's sure. It's secure. He says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. No one can take away the salvation we have in Jesus. No one can take away the beauty that God is making of all our circumstances in its time. Whatever God does endures forever. and Nothing can be added to it. God is, God is working this. He's in control. We can't add anything to it. No one can add anything to what God is doing. And he is in control and he is good and he's making everything beautiful in its time. Nothing can be taken away from it. No one can pluck you from the, from the hand of God. No one can undo the work of God in this world and in your life. We're secure in God's control and he's making everything beautiful in its time. And so why? Why is there a time for every season? Or there is a season for, and a time for every matter under heaven? Why is in God in control of all of it? What is he doing? He says at the end of verse 14, he says, God has done it so that people fear before him. God wants people through his action, through history, through creation, through the fall, through all of history, through sending Jesus to die on the cross for us, rise again. And in this time that we're waiting, in every season of life, the good and the bad, what is God doing? He's done it so that people fear before him. That we would, when we recognize that how great God is, and that we're not great or and that we're not God. It should lead us to humble ourselves before him. To trust in him and follow him with all that we have. And all that we are. When we see that God is in control and we are not. 
We should submit ourselves to Him, to follow Him, to seek new life in Him through His Son, Jesus. That we seek forgiveness from Him because we know that we haven't met His holy standard. We should fear before Him, submit ourselves to Him. That's what God is doing with all of this in history. Everything that He's in control of, every season, every time, He's doing it so that we would turn in reverence to Him, that we would seek Him as God and submit to Him, hope in Him, the one who is in control of everything. No, no one can add to what He's done. No one can take away from what He's done. And he's making everything beautiful in His time. He's doing that so we would come to seek Him. He's put eternity in our hearts so that we would come to seek Him. All He's done should lead us to bow ourselves before Him. He says in verse 15, He says, That which is already has been, that which is to be, already has been and God seeks what has been driven away so as as history repeats itself as we saw in chapter 1 that that nature it goes in these cycles back and forth never really accomplishing anything as history repeats itself under God's control we can see that God's hand is in it, that God has done it for his purposes, that he's making it beautiful in its time and that he's doing it so that people would fear before him. And this last part of verse 15, it's it's notoriously been hard t- for translators to translate and many different versions uh, translate it in different ways, but I love what Philip Ryken has done with the, the ESV translation. It says, God seeks what has been driven away. And Riken says that language of seeking is so positive that it suggests that God is looking to redeem the past and not simply to render judgment. By his grace, he will recover and restore what seems from our vantage point to be lost forever. God is seeking to redeem what is broken in us. We see that that sin has led us to a broken relationship with God. But as as we seek and fear before him, as we come and submit to him, God is seeking what has been driven away. It says what what is gone, what we thought was gone forever in our past. God is seeking to redeem it. The good and the bad, he's making everything beautiful in its time. And he does that. He redeems our hearts. He redeems us. He restores what's been broken in us through Jesus. Through a restored relationship with him by faith that Jesus came. He lived as a man. He he lived a perfect life of obedience when we couldn't. And because we couldn't and we owed a debt because of our sin, Jesus paid the debt. He died on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sins. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again to new life. And he promises that those who trust in him will have new life now as well and will have our relationship with God restored forever and we will be able to be in his presence for eternity where there is fullness of joy. We will be able to taste what we were made for the eternity that we were made for. It's through Jesus, through faith in him, we receive forgiveness of sins, new life now so that we can live in light of eternity, that we can be joyful, that we can do good and thankfully enjoy the good gifts that God has given us. It's through faith in Jesus that the brokenness in our past can be made new, that everything will be made beautiful in its time. 
It's through Jesus. We see this, this promise. God promised all the way in the Old Testament that he would send someone to restore all things. And Jesus takes this upon himself in the, in the book of Luke. But the promise is in Isaiah 61, verse 3. And he says, he's going to grant those who mourn in Zion, he's going to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. He's promising to restore, to, to wipe away the tear from those who mourn. He's promising that what's broken He's going to make beautiful because he's made everything beautiful in its time. What God does lasts forever. And for those who are his, he is restoring what has been broken. He is making it beautiful in its time. Can you trust in that now? All that God has done is sure and secure. And he can redeem what's broken in our lives. Trust that. Let your heart rest in that. And live for eternity now. Pray with me. God, we see that your hand has been over all of history. All that you've done is, is sure and secure. And you're doing it. All that you do in every season of life, that you're doing it so that you would point us to you. You've set eternity in our hearts that we would seek you. You've done all your works that we would fear before you. And that through Jesus, all the brokenness that we see can replace our ashes of mourning with, with beauty. That you are, you are redeeming us, you are redeeming our past through faith in Jesus. God, I pray that we would put our trust in Jesus and find that beauty in every circumstance, that we would trust that you are in control of all things. And like Solomon, turn from despair to hope because you are good and you are making everything beautiful in its time. God, I pray that we would live for eternity now, that we would be joyful beyond compare, that we would do good as evidence of the new life that we have in you and that we would enjoy your good gifts, thankfully, pointing those things back in praise to you. God, I pray for those who are, who are trusting in you now, God, that they would, they would find that hope in you as well. Thank you that, that you are in control of all things and you're working them for our good. Let us rest in that. Let us rest in you and live for eternity now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been great to have you here with us online. We are going to go into a time of worship, so hang around with us. But we would love to see you in person as you feel comfortable. We meet Sundays at 4.30 p.m. at 136 Louisiana Boulevard. If you're, able, if you're available, if you're comfortable, we'd love to for you to join us in person. But for now, we love having you online. So connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. Now sing Jesus praises with us now. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking It was 
my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I cannot give His wounds have paid my ransom.